The Celtics Talk Podcast is presented by 24autogroup.com, 11 locations across New England. What's up, everybody? Off the edition of the Celtics Talk Podcast. Hopefully a uh, little bit of a palate cleanser as you digest Celtics' latest loss. Uh, we're downshifting, avoiding anything to do with that game. I made the mistake of waiting to tape this intro to the off-day pod until after that Hawks game. And, well, like like I said, let's just move on. Uh, today, we're downshifting. We are steering clear of game action to talk about one of the bigger picture issues looming for the Celtics before the end of the season. And that is Drew Holiday becomes extension eligible six months after first arriving in Boston on October 1st. So on April 1st, he's eligible to start signing a potential long-term extension with the Boston Celtics. And I think when the Celtics made this deal, giving up what they did, now you can, if you're like LeBron James and you say they gave up nothing but a bag of Lay's potato chips, disrespectful, uh, the Celtics did give up assets in terms of Robert Williams, Malcolm Brogdon, uh, draft picks. And so uh, they did pay a pretty hefty ransom to get Drew Holiday to Boston. Now, certainly it's been worth it. Drew has been fantastic for this team and a big part of their success this year. But you don't make a trade of that magnitude with the expectation that he's only here for one season. And yet, Drew has a $39.4 million player option on next season. Now, your instinct is to say, well, $39.4 million. No one's turning that money down. Here's the thing. The couple things. One, if you start looking ahead to the free agent class next season, not a lot of UFAs or potential UFAs out there that would be worth splurging on. And well, you might say, hey, well, Chris, there's not even how many cap t- teams with cap space would want to spend their money on a 34 year old point guard. Problem is, one of those teams happens to be the Philadelphia 76ers, who could potentially get involved in the recruitment of an elite level player maybe a piece that they think could push them over the top. And two, you only need to rewind to a few seasons ago when we had the same conversation about Al Horford. And hey, look, I was chief among them. I was like, there's no way I was walking away from the 2019 Celtics to go find and going to find a better deal than than what was uh, the final year of that contract. Ironically, it was that same Sixer team that lured him away. Now it all worked out in the end, but the 2019 season ending badly only sort of fueled the uh the need for for or maybe made it a little bit easier for for al to to take that payday and and try to go to philadelphia and chase that championship thinking you know he was joining an, an elite squad unfortunately we know what happened he got m- a bunch of the blame for that team not meeting expectations and within a year was in oklahoma city so i don't know how it's all going to play out with drew holiday both sides have ample motivation to consider an extension, but Celtics will probably, you know, have to be a little bit more diligent with the books moving forward, given the repeater penalties that are looming and Drew's got to get as much of a payday as he can here at the tail end of his career. He's probably entering one last big contract. And so it's going to be a fascinating little chess match to decide, you know, exactly if a big deal gets done and, you know, lingering over all of this, not only is Derek White's ex- extension, to that the, and, and the Jays, their big uh, contracts hitting the books in the next two years. But Celtics are a championship level team, and the focus should be over the next couple months on that. So, you know, there'll be the small window where they can potentially get a deal done. And if not, I think it'll just be tabled to the summer when the team might be better equipped to, to handle this conversation. But I just thought it was a fascinating conversation. And given the approaching date, I wanted to kind of put it in the spotlight. So, Call them my friend, Ryan Bernardoni. You know him as Danger Cart on Twitter. You've uh, probably heard him on this program before. Uh, Ryan, in addition to just being an excellent basketball mind, is as good as anybody with the cap stuff and an invaluable resource as I sometimes, or I should say often, bounce ridiculous things off of him, and he knows the answers right away. Um, and so I, I just want to get his perspective on how we feel this might play out. What is the right decision for the Celtics? Is it better to 
potentially even move on from Drew Holiday. And as crazy as that sounds, considering what you paid to get him, you know, maybe that gets a little bit easier depending on what happens in April, May, in June. So let's not dance around that anymore. Let's get to our chat with Ryan Bernardoni. All right, Ryan, you know the situation. April 1 seems to be the date eligible to sign an extension. He is on the books right now, $39.4 million with likely incentives. Drew Holiday turns 34 on June 12th, potentially, as part of the Celtics finals run. Just that big picture. Like, I think a lot of people have just assumed, like, oh, you spend all these these assets, including Rob Williams, to go get a Drew Holiday, that it's a it's a no-brainer that you're gonna pay to get him back. But there's sort of be sort of seems to be this lingering notion of well, he's just going to sign one of those Al Horford-like deals where the number drops significantly and you get all these extra years. I don't know if that's like the way this is going to play out. When you sort of step back and just examine this from a big picture perspective, what jumps out? Well, you said the Al Horford deal. And I guess the first thing is, which Al Horford deal are we talking about? <laughs> right. Before this Al Horford deal, Al Horford was in this situation and left the Celtics in a move that worked out for kind of worked out for everybody like didn't work out for him in philly but he got the the money that he wanted and then ended up back here at sort of the peak of when this this team is hopefully going to win the title with him anyway uh and it wasn't the right contract for the celtics to be signing him on at that time and i think that's a good place to start um is that nobody in this conversation is saying that drew holiday is not a good player nobody's saying that jalen or jason or Derek white or christoph Porzingis are not good players or that a bunch of players on the bench aren't good players there's just a reality that it would have been difficult in the old financial environment, the old CBA, to keep a team like this together for a very long time. In the new CBA, it's it's not like technically impossible. It's just extremely difficult to envision um, unless you take a position of just like, I don't worry about any of the rules or any of the financial realities, and I just pretend that they don't exist and say, well, they should just go ahead and do all these things because so that's what I want them to do and go that way. But we've seen in the past with this team and with this front office and ownership that like they 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 have to play by the rules and they have financial realities that um, that may be much more positive for them than they are for a lot of small market teams. But they do not have an infinite spend capability, uh, mm -hmm. even though they've spent really heavily in, in the last couple of years to their credit. So I think that's where the conversation starts is that we have to talk about this and we are going to have to talk about players potentially leaving the team. And it's not because we don't think those players are good right. or think that those players will be good in the next couple of years or that they're helpful on this team or that they're not making sacrifices to make this team as good as it is right now. It's the reality of the league of the other 29 teams or maybe 20 of those 30, you know, 29 other teams getting together and saying, we're not going to allow teams to look like this for more than a year or two and having to deal with that. And I think, so that's where the conversation starts with Drew is like, how does he fit compared to the other four or five or six players that you were really talking about here? Because you can't keep them all. And so I think that's that that's a great point in terms of so you 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 have all your spreadsheets and stuff like that and you said you were crunching the numbers like how quickly does it become prohibitive? I think we know Jalen's contracts hits the books next year. That's going to add a wrinkle to all this. You know, you're looking at a situation where like let's just say Drew came back on that thirty nine million dollars. He's the second highest paid player behind. Uh, behind Jalen, you know, Jason's extension or what we assume extension this summer will not kick in for two years. It feels like you can get away with it next year, but then it gets really difficult. And then sort of maximizing that asset gets a lot more difficult too. Yeah. So uh, I think you have to talk about, again, a couple of different th things in here. Um, the focus since the new CBA came in has been on this like second apron stuff around, well, if you're a second apron team, you can't make trades in a certain way you lose access to certain exceptions um you lose you know frozen draft picks and things like that and that's been the focus of it in my opinion the bigger thing for the celtics long term will be the changes in the luxury tax and the fact that the repeater tax that has existed for a long time not starting next year but starting the year after that becomes a totally different animal than what it has ever been in the past uh, it becomes a thing where tax values like tax payments spin out of control to the point where you're very quickly paying more in tax than you're paying for your, all of the salaries on the team. And in fact, like more than not, not like 101%, like a lot more in tax than you would be paying for all the salaries on the entire team if you keep everybody together. And the repeater tax, right, is if you've been a tax team three of the past four years, then you're a repeater. So 
they're this is the second year in a row that they've been been paying luxury tax. If you pay the luxury tax again next year, it means that the year after that you are a repeater. It means that the year after that you are a repeater. And those years after that are the years after Jason's extension has kicked in as well. And so then you have two guys who are making 35% of the luxury tax. And it's very, very difficult to put together like a roster that makes sense with that reality and being a repeater, unless you're just saying we will pay more in luxury tax than we're paying for all of the salaries on the team, right? And that becomes really difficult because then what you're saying is either we're going to go for it next year and then we're going to cut a lot of salary. So we'll keep Drew on the team next year. If it's at 39 million, that's whatever. If it's at pick another number, there's not right. really a number you can make that keeps you under that gets you under the luxury tax other than zero. Mm-hmm. Right. So if he drops his salary to 30 million, you're still a luxury tax team. So then you get into a situation where the year after that, when you're a repeater, it's not cutting one player. It's losing two players, three players. It's losing multiple players and trying to reconfigure your team with less expensive options at multiple positions to get you, if not entirely out of the tax, to get you much, much lower so that you're not paying seven, eight, nine times penalties on your you know dollar spend. And so that's where it gets really difficult of like, is there a number that you bring back that you extend Drew on that adds years where you are confident that you can then either just say, we are going to spend $500 million in salary and tax, or we're confident that there's other moves we can make that quickly cut salary. And that's a whole nother conversation about how you quickly cut salary has become Mm -hmm. difficult in recent years. Um, And so that's really where I think like a lot of the focus, again, has been on apron stuff. And I think you can deal with the apron, like even frozen draft picks, you might trade that draft pick anyway for really good players. Like having a draft pick frozen is not conceptually different than having it traded for a player right who's way in the future or that pick being way in the future it's the i think it's ultimately the money that causes a you know a major problem with with all of the roster construction they have now yeah and there's, so there's some thought that with the new tv money coming in with potential expansion on the horizon when expansion happens teams will presumably get a pretty big hefty check that will maybe offset some of their spending but you, as you said like you just no matter how you crunch the numbers, when you start looking two, three years down the road, it's way above and beyond what this team has been willing to spend, even when it's spent to be a contender. And I don't know how you make the math work. It it, it just opens up like it, it 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 you just can't you just don't get the sense that it's 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 truly fathomable to be to be in that position beyond maybe the year. Jason kicks in and we haven't even talked about like, we got to talk about Derek white and that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but okay. So you brought up Al Horford. I think that's a great starting point because, okay. It's unfair to compare 2019 and 2024, completely different seasons, hopefully completely different endings. But you know, that Kyrie disaster certainly enticed Al to be like, let me go see what else is out there. The Sixers were more than willing to give that money, even at his age. And he walked away from a deal that, even I was on TV screaming, oh, there's no way he's walking away from that number. I think it's a very similar situation. Same agent, you know, like where Drew is going to have a market, even at 34. He was an all-star last year. He's shooting 64% on three, the corner three-pointers this year. He's an all-defense guy. He's obviously a winner. I, I guess the, the the question becomes, do you even run the risk that he, like, do you just – how do you proceed if you're the Celtics? Are you eager to get a deal done or do you are you willing to take this into the summer when, depending on how this season plays out, maybe you're a little bit more flexible on what your options might be in terms of, okay, you want a title. Maybe that makes it easier to make a, a harder decision to, to, not, to, to necessarily move on from Drew Holiday. Yeah, so I think every time I appear on any podcast, including the last time I was on this one, I have to say there's a lot of things that I don't know, right? There's mm-hmm. a lot of things that we don't know about what how the team is operating uh if the team says hey we can spend 500 million dollars for two years in a row because we think that there's expansion money coming and a new tv deal that we're somehow getting enough money out of this where we're okay with it great great i'm a celtics fan great i would i love it it's it's purely a matter of like i don't i just can't imagine that that's really what's going to happen right are they really going to spend more than steve ballmer who has more money than the bottom 20 owners combined right which is the legitimate finances of like the late of the clippers is like they have an owner so wealthy that he has more money than 18 or 20 teams combined owner you know ownership groups combined 
So I don't think that they can spend that much. And so you have to make these decisions. And if the reality is that what you can do with Drew is you can extend him and have it cut $5 million, $7 million, $9 million off of his salary next year and add two, three years onto the end of that, like that's not enough money to really matter. Like, I don't think, I don't know if you actually even want that contract long-term, right? That's one of the other questions, again, that we had in 2019 with Al Horford is like, I think I had said, I'm happy that he's going to the Sixers because if someone's going to pay a contract that I don't want the Celtics to pay, I would rather it be one of their rivals than just some random team. Because like, if I think that it's a bad deal, then I would like for it to go to a place that I think will end up hamstringing that team. And it ended up hamstringing that team, right? So there's a question of like, do you even want to sign that deal for a player at the age that he's at? Again, even though he's been really good this year, I think he's been better than it has been talked about. There's mm-hmm. so many guys to talk about on this team that I don't think much focus has gone into like the actual sacrifice that he's made the difference that he's made in the sort of post Porzingis trade, pre drew trade, what we thought the team was going to look like to the reality of what they have looked like the incredible shooting. He's giving them in the, from the corners, like a lot of great things, but do you want to say, we're going to give you $110 million guaranteed over the next three or four years. Like you can, we can talk about contract structures about non-guaranteed final sure. years or partly guaranteed ways that you can sort of push money around a little bit here and there to push $3 million further into the future and things like that. But is that a contract that you want for a player in their mid thirties who is functionally the fifth starter on the team at, at the moment, even if, even if he's the best fifth starter in the league, he is the fifth starter. Can, are you better off with the other financial realities of reconstruction, like reconstructing some of your cap sheet and saying, okay, we're going to find a player who's the best facsimile we can, who makes so much less money that it gets us all the way under the luxury tax next year and gives us, multiple years then where we are not a repeater because we got under and we find a way to get two more years of not being a repeater where you don't have to make the other big move that's going to have to come where you're saying okay we're going to trade Jalen or we're going to let Porzingis walk or we're going to not even getting into what Derek White's going to get paid like you said we it's a discussion we talk about but there's others what's going to happen with Sam Hauser the league leader in plus minus he's non-guaranteed next year do they make him an unrestricted free agent in two years or make him an un- or a restricted free agent this coming summer how much money does that add luke Cornette suddenly you know looks like a player who's not a minimum salary player anymore right you have all these other questions that come up that just add money and add money and add money and so for all that i think that drew has been really good and really valuable this year and maybe a critical player in winning a title i don't think you can sign him to an a to an extension at a dollar value that he is going to accept that doesn't probably cause you more problems down the road than mm. it gets you in value for next year i i've started coming initially i thought we know how much brad loves security the idea of like having no other distractions and loves to sign extensions right loves, more than anybody loves to sign extensions so part of me said we're gonna get the first and it'll just be a deal and it'll take everything off the table and the singular focus will be on competing for a title. But the more I kind of sink my teeth into this, the more I'm like, I don't know. Like, I think part of the reason I keep saying that you can, if you just wait at least until the summer, things change a little bit if you win a title, right? Like maybe you're more emboldened to bring this back and pay the ransom and be like, hey, we got a title. Everything's gravy now. We're going to make a ton of money off of this. You got, you know, all these documentaries they're filming where we're going to be a dynasty now, like whatever you, whatever you're thinking, or maybe you go the other way and you say, all right, we won one, you know, we don't need to to necessarily roll the dice on, on something like Drew. And so I, I wonder if they're more likely to push it off. Now, I would suspect Drew's camp would prefer. And the other thing at play here is you did give up a pretty, and I, I know LeBron was on with JJ Reddick the other day and called it a bag of potato chips. That's hurtful for this Robert Williams supporter. But you did give up a pretty good chunk of assets to to make this deal. And you can't just move on after a year and not feel like it would have been a little bit of an overspend, especially if you don't come away with a title. So I I wonder if we're just going to have to wait to the summer to fully dive into this. You know, if Drew's people come to the table and say, like, we really want a four-year deal. Maybe there is an option on that last one at – 40 but it's descending 40 million a season but it's this i don't you know like whatever the case may be what are the hesitations if you're if you do realize at some point you might have to get off this deal are you confident you can move off that deal in future seasons if for whatever reason you needed to start cutting salary 
it's it's tough, right? You can't be super confident about that for for a couple of reasons. One is that you're not necessarily just talking about his deal, right? You're talking about moving one of any of a set of deals, and that opens up a pretty wide risk of injury, right? If a player yeah. suffers a really significant injury, they become the player that you want to move, whether that's Drew or, or anybody else. Any of the, the big salary players could be in that situation where you're saying, well, if we trade Drew now, then we have another guy who's kind of dead salary because he has this injury that's going to be out for a year. It might be career, whatever. You don't want to talk about that and think about that. Like, it's a possibility that can, that can happen in there. The other thing is just degradation of performance as a player gets older, right? Sometimes players hit a cliff and, mm -hmm. and they're different players. Then the bigger part of it is something that I don't hear talked about very much across any of this stuff, which is like, how? How do you cut salary quickly? Yeah. What you need to do is cut salary to cut salary in the year that you're in. If you're trying to cut salary for the next year, great. You trade for an expiring contract, right? The value of expiring contracts has increased according to everybody, although we haven't necessarily seen it yet. Because that gets you out a year, uh, a year of money out. If if you can only trade basically into cap space because you can't trade for non guaranteed contracts that you can then waive, those don't count in salary matching, and you're limited as an apron team and like what you can do with exceptions and things like that, like you you get to a point where it's like okay, who is the team that has cap space that wants this contract now so that we're cutting thirty million dollars in salary not a year from now when it won't matter because we'll have already incurred these luxury tax bills and, and locked in our repeater status, how do you do it now? And it becomes a challenge. Like who is mm -hmm. that team? You can imagine a situation where the Spurs say, right. we have Wembenyama, we want to be good next year, but we don't want a 34 year old point guard with three or four more years. We would love to have Drew Holiday for $39 million for one year. So if he opts in, and the Celtics say, we still want to move on and find some way. You can imagine teams that would take him for one year saying, this is really helpful for us. Is there a team that's going to look at that contract and say, yeah, we want that contract for $110 million or $120 million or 100 whatever it might be million dollars for three or four additional years. And yes, there absolutely there might be. But in general, teams that have cap space aren't really good teams. And so they don't want you know, mid thirties players making big money for two, three, and four years. They want, they might take that as a flexible option, the, the balloon payment for one year, holding your cap space, uh, you know, the idea of you do that with, with free agents and things like that. So I'm not super confident that they could move his contract, even if he continues to play really well in a way that resolves the problem. Could you trade him for two role players who each make, you know, $15 million and whatever? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can work that out, but that doesn't solve the problem if the problem is total money on the books and it just gets to a point where it's like, again, like if they don't care, if they are just like, we don't care, we will spend all the money in the world. Then I don't really have to worry about it anymore. It's just a question of like, if that's not the case, then it's really hard to say like, yeah, you should lock that, that contract in um, because it's going to eventually cost you probably like two of your five high salary players you you can't really have four let alone five like you need to get to some point and how is that like how do you work that if you're saying that he's your fifth starter are you going to lock him in knowing that that might cost you two of the other guy right um so if it were me i would wait and like the risk is that he walks right it's that he opts out and then right. walks somewhere else for nothing but if we're talking about wanting to clear 30 something million dollars in salary like at some point that has to happen. Mm -hmm. You have to lose the guy for very little in return in terms of money and opting out and letting him walk is one way of doing that. The other ways that he opts in and gets traded into a team where it's mostly cap space team. Like I said, you know, just imagine the Spurs. Yeah. And then you take that situation where you're now not only not a tax team, you're not an apron team, you're not any of these things. And you have some additional flexibility to try to refill that roster spot in that role. Um, but I think in terms of like, the options that are available to you, both of those, all three of those, right? He opts in and you keep him and you just pay a bunch of money and then deal with it, you know, kick the can down, down the line another year, or he opts in and you trade him, or he opts out and he leaves for nothing are all safer options than signing him to a major multi-year extension mm. a week from now. It's it's fascinating because I just think a lot of us thought it was like a foregone conclusion uh, yeah, when it, you know, like when, when, when you first make the deal, it just, you, we all get sort of lulled into it, but I, I think, think a lot of people right. thought Derek White was going to extend too. Though. Right. Part of that is the history of having signed so many extensions. You get <laughs> Brad, into this Brad weird history. thing where like the Marcus Smart extension was very easy because it was like, this is all the money we can offer you. This is all the money we can offer you. Take it or leave it. We would love to have you back, but we literally are not allowed to offer you anymore. And the same thing happened with Derek White. And he went the other direction and said, that's not enough. I'm not going to take it. 
Marx said, yes, it is enough. With Drew, you're talking about something different. You're talking about finding a middle ground on an amount. When, like I said, the middle, like the, the value that the Celtics might want out of that fifth starter might be someone who makes $10 million. Yeah. And that's not, if you're talking about 30 or 32 or five or nine, if you, what you need to be spending there is 10, you're not in the, like, this is not a conversation that leads anywhere. Um, so yeah. And, and like, if on April 1st, he signs an extension, then it just changes my thinking about what the financial realities of the team are. Maybe they have other trades already in their pocket. They know that they're going to be doing these other things. Like, right. again, things that we don't know. Um, but it's for like, as a complete outside observer, just looking at the math, it's like, I don't think I would do it. Uh, and that kind of sucks for a player who's also like one of my favorite players in the league before he was a Celtic, but he was sort of my favorite non-Celtic player in the entire league. <laughs> which is not a surprise when you consider that Marcus Smart was my favorite Celtic player. <laughs> so it sucks to have to say, but it's just like, you're the first man up in terms of the money now. And I don't know what else they can do. Yeah. All right. Lead me through the, we, we, we obviously came up with the trade deadline, whether the Celtics would have interest in someone like Caruso. Certainly that's, we, I, I know we've bounced it off around uh, offline about whether, you know, that's one of the ways you get a little bit cheaper at that position or cheaper will maintaining your defensive uh, all defensive status there, you know, lead me through like what the the roadmap would be to, you know, move on from drew and try to get maybe cheaper at that position and, and kind of straddle that, that two line. Yeah. So there's a couple of different ways you can envision it. Um, you can say you have to go out and get a replacement, an external replacement, but you need to get one that's making a lot less. And that is where you get into the Alex Caruso conversation of like, he only has one more year left, but he makes so little money compared to his production that you can with some other sacrifices. We don't know exactly what those would be, but imagine a situation where you get all the way under the luxury tax. It gets really tight. It would help if the salary cap next year comes in a little higher than they're mm -hmm. currently estimating instead of like continuing to drop each time they put out new estimates, which is traditionally what has happened. It usually yeah. comes in a little bit higher than their last assessment. Uh, but the money gets tight, but you can put together a situation where it's like, okay, we go and get Alex Caruso and replace Drew Holiday, who leaves for functionally nothing or literally nothing. Um, now that's going to cost a lot right? Like it's one more year on his deal. The bulls, God knows ever what the bulls are doing. They may, no idea. they may sign him to an extension this, this off season. I mean, hard to see that with the extension rules that are in place and how little he makes, but like, it's very difficult to, to come up with what that would be. But like, if you're saying, Hey, we're just going to, we're going to trade two or three more draft picks here. Right. Like you can put together a trade where you, where that becomes possibility particularly if Drew is going out in trade versus going out in just leaving a free agency, it becomes easier to make some of that math work, but you can go out and get somebody like that. Anybody can look in the, look in the, you know, salary lists and basketball reference or anywhere else and say, okay, who makes about $10 million. Okay. We can manage that somehow getting all the way under the luxury tax, giving us another year on the repeater, all that, figuring it out that way. You can also do an internal thing. You can say, we're going to go even bigger. We're going to play Sam Hauser. We're going to start Sam Hauser. You could say we're going to go a little smaller and start Peyton Pritchard. You can do whatever you want to do. Um, you can say if you are a really close observer of the main Celtics, you can say Jordan Walsh is going to be the answer to this two or three years down the line. And so we're just looking to bridge. So now it's screwed. So for one year, it would be OK. Or, you know, you can come up with different ways, internal, external, whatever it might be to try to resolve that. You can also just say, like, well, if teams aren't going to be allowed to be built this way, we just have to accept that the fifth starter is not going to be a former all star current 65% corner three point shooter, all that. And just say like, listen, this is the reality of it. Like we're going to have to get, go sign somebody for the minimum who is not ideal and just kind of roll with it. Um, so there's different ways you can go about it. Like there's not one definitive answer for how to do it. Um, it's a pretty creative front office that's come up with good answers for things. Um, I think, as you mentioned before, like whether or not you win the title or not changes a lot of things. It changes not only your appetite for spending your, you know, how different players are perceiving your team. I think it changes this is still an entertainment business. You still have customers who are out there who are called fans, what they're willing to accept. And, you know, we've seen with the Red Sox, the sort of degradation of trust of this ownership group, even though they won all of these titles, you get a little bit of a, a grace period there, though, where if you win, then you can make some decisions like that that will be more accepted. So there's a lot of different factors that go in play, but a lot of different factors that go in play. Also, a lot of different paths that you can answer that question with that I don't think are like completely unreasonable, right? These are not things where if you're like, okay, next year we have to let Drew go because he didn't, we couldn't come to an extension. He decided to opt out. We had no power over it. He went to a different team. Just plugging Sam Hauser into your starting spot is not like, it's not a disaster. No. Like it's a problem, <laughs> but it's not, it's a clear loss of talent, a significant like major loss of talent, but teams lose talent. 
teams have to reconfigure things and, and you have to go forward. It's not what I would hope would happen, but like you can, if that's like your worst case scenario and you have feel like you have no other choice in the matter, like that's what the new CBA does. Like, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to everybody who doesn't want to hear it. Like that's the nature of the new rules are to force teams like the Celtics to do exactly that. And so if that's what ends up happening, you know, don't yell at me, yell at Alex Silver and the other. Yeah, yeah, like, ownership groups who wanted this. Yeah, like Grant Williams for negotiating that CBA and uh, Grant you know, negotiated all... a CBA that got him paid. That's been <laughs> my my take on it is that they looked at it and went, "Boy, we don't know if we can afford Grant Williams anymore." Like he, it was like exactly mathematically done to be like, "I'm going to go and get this money out on the market," and I my I don't want the Celtics to be able to match it, and I'll go and figure that out. Um, so I don't know. He did his he did a good job. Let's uh let's wrap on a couple things. Like, how does the Derek White situation? sort of hover above all this. I don't think it changes anything like in terms of how they approach. It. I think we know Derek is going to get paid by the Celtics. Like if you're identifying the long-term core. Do you know that? I mean, I, I think, think so. so. I think so. I... But like his, is, is he going to sign the next extension? Like the next, when he can sign an extension this off season, it's for an additional year. So it's more, obviously a lot more total money than the extension that they offered him last. I mean, he may have just said like, I'm going to wait a year and sign that. But if he's like an all-star level player, mm. is it enough money? Is he going to look at it and say, well, I can get $35, $40 million in free agency if I wait, wait out to the end of my contract? And and are you right back in this exact same conversation again a year from now about the next player? Because like I said, it's really hard to do four. We're talking about how to go from five to four. It's hard to even say at four. Something else eventually has to happen. And like my conception of the team is that the, the longer term future is Tatum, Porzingis, and White. And that mm -hmm. doesn't include Jalen, even though he's been playing great this year. And, and maybe that has changed somewhat because of that. But like, I can't be 100% certain that that Derek White's a long-term part of the team because he might decide that he doesn't want that, that he wants more money somewhere else. Like, I don't know. I, I don't, he doesn't text me and tell me what he's thinking, right? <laughs> but I, I agree that we should conceive of the team at this point still, that he will be on the team long-term. Yeah, and that's just the way I operate is that, like, I think this front office is really smart. And I do think they know, obviously, more. They, they know, like, where, what, what what potential directions. But they also leave themselves avenues to shift here. And I just think you bring in Porzingis and you're like, okay, you know, if we don't win one this year, at least, you know, now you can – What which which two of these or three of these five are the ones we're riding forward with? I do think they're just kind of – it's not so much kicking the can down the road. It's just making sure you have options and, you know, the potential paths. And some of them – like, each one has their pain point. And I, I don't know how exactly it's going to play out, but I do think they've at least given them some, and I give them a lot of credit too. One of the things I think has been overlooked this year is just, you know, they went for it on like the last possible gasp here of, of like, you know, teams being able to load up the way they did. And I, I, I just assume they noticed that and said, kind of got to kind of got to push all in right now. And, and it certainly seems to, to have delivered them to where, you know, the best possible chance of, of winning a title. Yeah, for sure. And and if you look at the recent history of the team, right, there, there's sort of this thing about like, oh, Jason Tatum has always played for super teams, right? Like it's the thing that gets up everybody's ire, including mine, who are in the Celtics fans, because you look at how many times they've rebuilt this team in short order from we're going to build through the draft to, oh, Isaiah Thomas is actually an all NBA player to, oh, we can go get Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving to, oh, that didn't work well. We're going to reconfigure around Jalen and Jason. Okay, wait, no, Al Horford's coming back. <laughs> oh, wait, there's a Kemba Walker time in there for a half a season before he gets injured. Then, oh, well, what if we go and get, you know, we're going to build this team with defense and Marcus Martin and Rob Williams for half a year look like the greatest team that's ever been around. And then now you're where you are. And so I know we don't have a lot of time here, but like I've criticized the Oklahoma City Thunder this year for not being more aggressive for sure. in, in going and saying that the, the low salaries they have on the team now are not something that lets you say, well, we don't need to answer any questions for two or three more years until those salaries become big. It's an opportunity right now, like having a recently drafted really good quarterback in the NFL making low money. Spend that time. That's an opportunity to build a different team a different way because you'll be able to pivot out of it anyway. You'll, you'll be in a position where you have so many other assets that you can continue to move. And eventually you run out of choices. You run, you run out of options. But the Celtics are not at a position now where they don't have options. It's that they almost have too many options, right? They have too many good players who other teams will want and who the Celtics want. And they simply, by rules, are going to find it very difficult to keep them all together. But that does mean that you have lots of different ways you can go, go about it. You can say, we're going to let Drew Holiday walk or trade him. You can say, well, we aren't going to be able to re-sign Derek White because he's become a player who's making almost too much. He was becoming too good. Um, the Porzingis extension 
coming in at the dollars that it did was very, very helpful to them, right? Mm -hmm. That it's a, now immediately looks like a below market deal, but also the conversations about Jalen and what could you, could you reconfigure the team by trading Jalen for, you know, DeJounte Murray and Jalen Johnson. And then that resolves two positions instead of one for cheap, right? You get all these different things. And not to say that any of them is correct, but it's good to have lots of choices. Yeah. Even if and... there's some paralysis by analysis, but like, They've been good about reconfiguring and being flexible and thinking on their feet about how to get through these things. And so I have faith, I have faith that they will do that, even though there's going to be for a Celtic fan like me, and a lot of other Celtic fans, there's going to be pain because it's like these players that I like, I didn't want them to trade Marcus Smart. Mm -hmm. I didn't want them to trade Rob Williams. Preach. But those so, things happen and it sucks, but yeah. it, it happens. And, yeah. and banners make it a little bit easier to digest, right? And so I will be... I've only seen one in my life. So you say plural. I'll have, I'm waiting to see. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my life. In my... I was five in 86, but yeah. Yeah. You don't know, remember? You know, I, 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 that's like one of my first... I, I'm I don't, from Connecticut. I, I'm... It wasn't on TV. Like I didn't have cable. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. It was like these things happened via newspaper box scores in my childhood. I don't I don't. I don't know. <laughs> fair. Fair. Um, let's just wrap real quick. Um what do you think happens with the 15th roster spot? And like, how, how do you feel about this team in general to, uh, to bring this, to bring it all full circle here? I mean, I honestly haven't thought about the 15th roster spot much lately. I, I know 15th roster spot stuff is always like, it gets the clicks, right? If, if you're it's blogging, amazing. Whatever, it, it's, it's always, the backup it's quarterback. Yeah. Um, you know, do they, do they just bring, bring up from the, from a two way? Mm. Uh, does, is it Kata who, who, you know, on the last couple of days of the year gets, gets upgraded to a full roster spot. I don't know. Um, I don't think it really matters if you're 15th man is playing in the playoffs, you've got other problems, right? Uh, my outlook on the team, it's hard to be anything other than very, you know, very positive. Um, my take on it is that they've done as good of a job as you can do about solving the problem that they have. And for all that, I love Jason Tatum and I will go and make any argument you want about why he should be MVP because it's fun to do. We, he's actually the seventh best player in the league, the sixth best player, in the league, whatever it might be. And the point that I've made many times is that, right, 85% of titles in the NBA since the merger, roughly 85%, go to a team that has a current or former MVP among their top two players. The Celtics don't have that. And so your problem is, how do you win a title without that? And the answer that they've come up with is, we are going to shoot the hell out of the ball. We're going to do, we're going to play really good defense, and we're just going to overwhelm everybody with volume of shots shot quality of having such good shooters at every position that we're going to do it and so i just look at it and say like tell i've said this before tell me what the celtics three-point shooting percentage is in any playoff series game by game mm -hmm. like give me seven numbers throw them in a hat we'll pull them out and we'll say these are the shooting percentages in these seven games just by knowing those seven numbers i'll tell you if they're going to win the series or not now the order that those numbers come out in might mean that they sweep it versus go seven games mm -hmm. or lose if the numbers are really bad but like even against the the nuggets They've lost two one-possession games against the Nuggets. They've shot 31% total across those two games. It's just simply below the threshold of where they need to be for the best possible teams. If they shoot 37 38%, let alone above that, 41%, you know, whatever it might be, for a series, I don't think there's a team that can beat them. Now, last year we saw that the, the downside of that, right? You are building a team to try to win a title without Nikola Jokic, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, the best player in the world. In doing that, in building more variance into your team, you open yourself up to the possibility of losing to a team that's not as good as you. They lost to the Heat because Jason Tatum got hurt in Game 7 and because mm -hmm. the Heat and Celtics both had outlier shooting series at the same time. The Heat up, the Celtics down, that's how they got upset. It was bad luck. It sucked. So could that happen again? Sure, it could happen anytime. It can always happen. That's part of the risk. But it's the only way, based on NBA history, that you have a realistic chance of winning when your best player is Jason Tatum instead of Nikola Jokic for all the Tatum is great. So I'm bullish on the team, but I think that's also the reality of the team. It's funny because Brad Stevens always says we had two bad weeks at the worst possible time. And like the Celtics really haven't had two bad weeks this year. Or if they have, they've like they really had two bad games. I mean, right. like, you know, two, like two game losing streaks. Like, do they, I, I almost wonder sometimes if, if you, if you, if you, you, you know, do they just need to, to get it out of their system before, but I mean, maybe they're just that good where, it doesn't matter, but it is going to be a fascinating run. Uh, and to bring this then to truly bring this conversation full circle, Drew Holiday shoots sixty four percent from the corner in the playoffs and forty percent beyond the three pointer. Good luck to the rest of the NBA. Yeah, because yep. that's you know Celtics probably winning the title at that point. That's part of the value, right? On any given night, you can have a guy who goes cold, and you just shift those shots to somebody else, and you have so many other good shooters that it's like, well, we still get to. 35, 36, 37 percent for that night, even on a not great shooting night for any individual or two individuals. And it's like they don't lose when they shoot well. They just don't. 
Mm-hmm. You know, whatever the number is, one loss in when they've had a game where they they shot well. So um, it is wild. Positive about that. It's really crazy the way they built the team. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ryan. I appreciate your knowledge. Thank you as always. Look no further than the award-winning 24 Auto Group with over 2,600 vehicles in stock. The brands you love, backed by the savings and service you can count on. Visit today or shop online at 24autogroup.com. All right, good stuff there from Ryan. I I think it's a fascinating decision. Like maybe there's a middle ground. Celtics knowing they have to navigate a Derek White extension sooner than later and aware that the Jays are going to be hitting the books, Jalen next season, chasing the year after that, you know, find a number that isn't quite as maybe as prohibitive as what Drew could ultimately get. Maybe he gives, a, but, I, but I just, I find it hard. Like he's on the books for $39.4 million. You almost, he could take that option and then just hit re- unrestricted free agency the year after. Um, but it just feels like in a season where he's shooting 64% from the corners, where he's played to an all defensive level and where he might be a key component of a championship level squad, he's probably got to, got to get that payday. And uh, if there are options out there for him, he's got to consider them. It's just like, you know, I don't begrudge the player. You only get so many opportunities here to do this. And if you've made yourself a valuable resource to, especially championship craving teams, around the league. There could be other options as we, we talked about, about satin trades and all that. Um, I still think the most likely scenario, if I had to guess, is still Drew being back in Boston, given what the Celtics gave up. It's just, there's so many different little obstacles along the way here. And just the Celtics have got to really be diligent in how they plan this thing out. Now, as we talked about with, with Ryan, there's a, there's a scenario where you're just like, you know what? We're going to sign this extension. We're going to take one less thing off our plate. We're just going to put all of our energy towards winning a title and we're just going to figure it out. The question is like, you know, whether that adds a layer of difficulty down the road as you need to either cut costs or whatnot. But I guess it's easier to cut costs than to try to add all defense type players and and talent to this roster. So Brad Stevens loves extension, but this one, this one's going to be difficult uh, to, 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 to nail down and uh, can't wait to see how it plays out in advance of the Celtics playoff run. Now, uh, one thing we should stress here is like Drew has been really good. I know he's been missing for a few games here with the dead arm or it's not a dead arm. Actually was what he said. It's uh, it's just that it, his shoulder is hurting it, the AC joint after uh, that hit in the wizards game. Uh, eager to see how quickly he can get back out on the court, get some, get some rust off, get some continuity back with that group. If you had Drew, you probably don't lose by that, that game in Atlanta the other night. Same thing with Derek White. So eager for the Celtics to have that group back out there. Our friends over at Fanatic Sportsbook. I want to see if Drew was in the conversation for Defensive Player of the Year. And actually, they've narrowed their field down to five players. And right now, it's Rudy Gobert at minus 900. Victor Wembanyama at plus 700. Jaron Jackson Jr. at plus 800. Bam Adebayo at plus 8,000. And then Anthony Davis at plus ten thousand. Um, Christoph Porzingis had been the highest, the the best odds for the Celtics for for much of the season, um, and Drew was always kind of lingering there. I wonder if we'll have a greater appreciation for what Drew brings defensively as we move into the postseason and we see some of those matchups and there's more of a spotlight on him guarding some of the better players and the versatility that he brings in defending some of the elite talent in the NBA. You know. Drew's ability to, you just can't screen him. Um, his ability to take on the best player on the other team when needed, to take on a Julius Randle when you need to 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 have him play bigger guys. It's a real luxury, and it sometimes blends in. Because let's think about it too. Like the Celtics have been so good offensively that we sometimes forget how good the defense has been and crawling up towards, I think they were at number two for, for a while here behind Minnesota. And uh, Drew deserves a lot of credit. There's a clip from the start of the season where Joe Mazzulla pretty much sit, yeah, in, 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 the, in the most verbal way tosses the keys to Drew Holiday and says, like, you have the you have the right to call whatever you want on the floor. Like, if you think this is the right thing to do, you do it. And that's a lot of freedom for a newcomer to a team that has a lot of defensive talent, that has an all defensive guy in Derek White, that has Jalen Brown playing some of the best defense of his career 
that Jason Tatum is an underrated defense when he's committed on that side of the floor. And Chris Stops, who has been a great rim protector this year. So uh, Drew has lived up to the hype defensively. I think you'll see him land. Him and Derek are my probably nods right now to land on an all-defense team. Uh, we know the stock exchange and how good they are at racking up steals and blocks. Um, I think they deserve a lot of credit for sort of spearheading this defense. Jalen's been great. I hope he gets some consideration there. Um, I think it's it's going to be tough in 10 spots for another Celtics player to to work their way on there. And uh, But because of their sort of resumes, I think Derek and Drew will get a lot of consideration. Be interested to see, you know, I don't know how, if, if Drew could pop back up on Fanatics odds, um, depending on where the Celtics finish in defensive rating, you know, someone deserves some of that credit. You know, maybe they'll get the team as a whole will be rewarded based on, again, some of those all defense nods, maybe some of the voting on that. Um, but don't sleep on what Drew's brought defensively because it doesn't always, it isn't always magnified. It's not always, you know, the spotlight, but Celtics have been really good because of what he's brought on that end of the floor. All right. We are back with you on the post game pod on Thursday night. Celtics back in Atlanta, hoping to uh, wash that bad taste out. We'll see if Drew Holiday is back on the court soon. Celtics have two more stops on this road trip, including one down in one of Drew's last stops with uh, one, one, one of his stops along his NBA journey with the Pelicans. Uh, could really use him and the, some some strength going up against Zion and the likes down there in New Orleans. And the trip finishes up in Charlotte uh, before the Celtics come home to finish out the month of April. And we get Kind of start turning our attention to uh, who's going to come out of that playoff bracket. Who's going to be a play-in bracket. Who's going to be the uh, first-round playoff opponent. A lot of fun times ahead. But go like, subscribe, check us out on the YouTube page. We'll catch you next time on the Celtics Talk Podcast. <laughs>